Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. I'm often asked, when do I tell a couple that their marriage is over? And my answer is, never. Because that decision is not up to me. Now, I've worked with couples that I was sure would only make that I was sure would make it only to be asked for a referral to a divorce attorney. And I've worked with couples that I never thought in a million years would figure it out. They would somehow right the ship and sail off into the proverbial sunset. So each couple is different, and so is each marriage. What works for one couple? won't work for another, but there are some warning signs that all couples should be on the lookout for if they want to have a healthy, happy marriage that lasts. So licensed marriage and family therapist Virginia Williamson is here to share what should set off alarm bells and actually more importantly, what to do if those alarm bells start ringing in your marriage. So Virginia, thanks for coming on the show and talking about something that I I think is really important for couples to know. Thank you for having me. In a recent article that appeared in Brides, it was called Seven Signs of a Bad Marriage According to a Marriage Therapist, and you are the marriage therapist that they were talking to. You identified some telling behaviors that are evidence of trouble. Um, Now, now unfortunately, we only have 30 minutes, so we're going to kind of have to go through these quickly. But the first three that you talked about feeling contempt, having your partner make you feel bad, or feeling controlled, those things seem to have some commonalities to them. But can you talk about what each one is and what makes them problematic? Of course. So with feeling contempt, it can show up in a variety of different ways, I find, in marriages. But essentially, when I'm working with a couple, I'm looking to see if they still have Mm -hmm. goodwill toward one another and respect for Mm -hmm. one another. And if they're not coming in with that, in my opinion, it has to be restored. Those things have to be restored in order for them to repair any damage that has already been done. And as you, I'm sure, experience quite often, couples may tend to come into therapy as a last resort rather than a first line of defense. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. You can see, you know, the eye rolling, you can see the discounting what the other person feels. Um, And in in the most extreme cases, I have certainly worked with couples where it seems like they can barely stand to be in the same room together. So Mm -hmm. those are the ways that contempt tend to show up um, from my perspective. The the made to feel bad, you you have to be a little bit careful with because there might be some work that you individually have to do to determine what am I bringing into this that may actually be from the past and isn't necessarily Mm -hmm. something that my partner is doing. And, but it may be that they are, again, discounting your thoughts and feelings, not encouraging you if there are things that you really want to, you know, to do either personally or professionally, um, you know, or just second guessing you quite a bit. So those are things that you'd want to be able to ask your partner to stop doing and explain how it impacts you. But, but again, super important to remember that you have to be able to tease out what is, as we often say, no one can make you feel anything, right? So what, what are you bringing into it and what is the other person doing to contribute to it? Yeah. And, the, the and I talk about control- that, you know, because, and again, We have this idea, and and I would really like to just blow it right out of everybody's mind that that (laughs) I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be happy all the time, and my part and I'm supposed to make my partner happy all the time. So this making each other feel bad, and I always talk about it. It's like, is it your intent to make the other person unhappy or or or? Hurt, you know, hurt their feelings, or is it a side effect of a real conversation that you have to have? Meaning, you know, I have to share that maybe something that you're doing is bothering me or, or actually does hurt my feelings, and in the process, 
it hurts your feelings. And we can say, oh, well, we're never supposed to be unhappy, which, of course, please just stop that because <laughs> that's not <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, if if you are finding yourself in the relationship feeling as though you can't be the person that you would like to be, it still requires mm-hmm. that what I keep calling, you know, teasing out, am, am I getting in my own way? Or is my partner getting in the way? And how do we talk about that together? Um, because I find that with with those couples that can, that either still do have goodwill toward one another or, or mm-hmm. can get there, the changes that we that they actually need to make typically are not that um, you know they're 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 not as huge they're they're typically small things <laughs> uh, right. you know that 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 can be that can be kind of fixed with really no skin off anybody's back once they understand each other and and that once they understand each other is a huge piece because I was just talking, I was just talking to a, a client this morning and, and you know, they, they have, they have this issue that they need to talk about. He brought up something that was really important, but it was very, it was, it was very hard. And she wasn't, and they happened to be physically separated at the moment because of work situations. And she wasn't prepared to have the conversation and he wanted to have it, and, you know, and she goes, well, what do you do? And I said, well, that's one of those things that you have to really, you know, tease, again, tease out because, you, you know, you have to be able to understand what's going on with your partner that, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't saying, I don't ever want to talk about it. It was just like, I don't, I'm not ready to talk about it right now because she's in, I mean, it's just not a really good time. So, yeah, so, I mean, there are all some of these things, but I want to get to the last one about feeling controlled because I hear that all the time. My partner is trying to control me. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, I I think it's important to be clear that I have worked with some couples where there has been abuse, emotional, physical, or both. Mm-hmm. And so if, oh, yeah. if it's, if it's a function of abuse, I think obviously it doesn't mean that couples therapy won't help, um, but it, it is something that I think has to be addressed in a more kind of black and white way than I t- typically prefer to work. <laughs> I, uh-huh. I, I prefer to work by seeing, you know, both sides of the, of the coin, but obviously if it's an abuse situation, that, that has to be addressed, I think, first and right. foremost. And, and, there are, and there are partners, men and women, that can tolerate uh, of course, if you have a, a strong therapeutic relationship with them, they can tolerate hearing. I, I think that that may be emotionally abusive to your partner. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, right. of course, physical abuse is pretty straightforward. But, mm-hmm. yeah, the, I, if it's not an abuse situation within a couple, I, I tend to find that the, that the efforts that one partner might make to control the other or that come across that way are, are another way of that partner trying to get their needs met and just not being able to express it right. in, in, a way, it in a way that can yeah. be received, you know, by their partner. So I, I often find that the, the, back to your point about intent, the intent isn't to make the person smaller or make their life smaller or the things that they want to do smaller, but there's some need that they have that isn't being fulfilled and rather than being able to identify and express that it comes across as trying to limit their partners, the other things that their partner is doing that are important to them. Right. And, and some of this is, you know, this idea of being controlled is part of what it's not so much about control. It's just what I tell my clients is, you know, that when you marry somebody, every decision you make directly or indirectly, or indirectly impacts your partner. And so, you know, they're going to have views about it. And because, you know, because they don't necessarily, you know, want you to do something or they do want you to do something that maybe you're not on board with, that isn't necessarily control. It's more negotiating how do we make this relationship work so both of us feel okay. Absolutely. And I, the word that I like to use is influence. And I, and I try to, talk with couples about the difference between allowing your partner to influence your position, not because they're controlling, but because you care about the, the impact that it has on them and vice versa. They should also allow your influence. 
that doesn't yeah. mean that you can't, if something is a, a word that we use often, I guess, deal breaker, if something is just absolutely, this is a boundary that I, I'm not going to budge on, of course, you shouldn't have to do that. But each right. person should should be able to have some influence over the other's position to a degree, because as you said, you're, you know, it, there's the each individual, and then there's the relationship, which is kind of its own entity. Right. So let's go to let's go to two more of the seven signs, and one of them is that a couple is no longer arguing, and the other one is body language is expressing disinterest. So what are these, and what makes them a sign of a bad marriage? So the no longer arguing, I've certainly worked with couples that are conflict avoidant by nature. Both part, I, I, um, truthfully, I would say more often I find that one person is conflict avoidant and the other is not. But I have worked with couples that are both conflict avoidant, and so they may not argue simply because that's how they're wired. But uh-huh. on the other hand, to me, if somebody, it's, it's. Um, if somebody is still passionate enough about the relationship to express their distress in in the marriage or, you know, their anger or their hurt or their sadness, they're still on the dance floor with each other. Okay. If, if they're, if they're not, if they don't even have the energy to, to express any of that to their partner, it, in my mind, they've, they've exited emotionally. <laughs> Okay. Uh, already yeah. in a certain way. And again, that doesn't mean that they can't come back, but if they're not, if they're no longer impacted by the behaviors of their partner, then they're not really engaging in the relationship from my perspective. Right. And so is, I mean, and talking about the body language expressing disinterest, when, when I read that, I mean, and I actually did read what you wrote about it, which then made more sense because sometimes body language is, misinterpreted Mm -hmm. and and so how would I know that my partner's body language is showing disinterest versus maybe discomfort or some other disc that we could come up with (laughs) right I think you have to ask it's something that I will do in session obviously if a couple is having these interactions on their own, they, they would have to ask each other, but I will ask um, if I see someone looking like they're shutting down or turning away, I'll, I'll ask what that, what's happening for them. And I think Uh couples can, they can do that on their own as well, ask for clarification. But I do tend to find that when I'm working with couples that still do have that goodwill toward one another there are tender moments when they're talking about the really tough stuff. And particularly if one or both of them becomes tearful or emotional, they, there are still those tender moments that I will observe that to me are an indication that they're still invested. They're still affected by how their partner is feeling. But again, you could eat couples can, can ask for that clarification on their own. They may not want to. They may, it may be a stuck pattern of one person starts to shut down and the other becomes infuriated and, you know, on and on they go. But I think it's always important to say, I feel like I've lost you or I feel like you are saturated or I feel like you don't want to have this conversation with me right now. Can you tell me what's happening for you, for you? Or is, is that what's happening? Or when uh-huh. can we revisit this or yeah, I mean, and it's, and, you know, it's, like you're saying, it's, it's nuanced and people can, can develop the habit, develop the practice of asking um, as opposed to assuming because we know what happens when we assume. And, uh-huh. <laughs> and because, you know, be, because, you know, people, I mean, it, what I tell my clients is I will not let my clients tell the other person what they're thinking, feeling, or what their motivation is. Now, you can ask them and you can say, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, what I'm seeing is because, you know, of of what I'm believing. But I have to check because if I just decide that my partner is doing this on purpose and and they're doing it with the intent to hurt me, then I'm going to respond in a completely different way from, oh, they're just, 
overwhelmed right now and, you know, they're having difficulty getting their thoughts together versus they're, they're just disinterested. And, you know, but again, this is, this is part of, I guess, what couples need to learn how to do or it would be helpful if they could. Right. I mean, the, the, if I'm working with a couple that where one person really gets a lot of relief from getting everything out there on the table and they kind of can't move on or let it go until they have, and if their partner is a person who gets very saturated with all of that information at one time, mm-hmm. from my perspective, the person who needs more words has to be willing to ask when they're seeing something that's off-putting and the person who needs less words has to become better at saying, I want to hear you, but I'm really saturated or I, I, I understood where we were going and now I feel like we're talking about something entirely different. (laughs) Right. I got got, got lost. Can, Can you stop and let me jump on again? This is happily ever after. It's just the beginning. I'm talking with fellow licensed marriage and family therapist, Virginia Williamson, about signs of a bad marriage and what you can do if you see them in yours. And if any of these sound familiar, please know that you're not alone. Bad marriages or even just okay ones can be made better. Learning what works and stopping the things that don't is what it takes, and I can help. If you're ready to have the marriage you've always wanted, then please don't wait another day. Send me an email or give me a call and schedule your free, no obligation, create your happily ever after discovery session. You can reach me by email at leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com. That's F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N-S, coaching, N is in Nancy, C is in charlie.com. Or you can reach me by phone at area code 919 so I want to get back to talking with Virginia about the signs um, of a bad marriage. And so the final two signs that you talk about are staying for the family and then having an emotional affair. So how common are these two signs? Staying for the family comes up with, I would say almost everyone, if not everyone that I meet with that is contemplating divorce for a number of reasons. One, because if there is a family, if there are children involved, uh, well, of course, there's always a family, there are parents and siblings. And, but if there are children involved, most of my clients don't take it lightly if they're going to make a decision that's going to potentially upend everyone's lives. And, mm-hmm. um, and then the other piece is often I will hear from clients that they feel like they can better manage the co-parenting in the marriage and that if they were in two different homes, the, if they do have different parenting styles or disputes that are pretty ingrained in their dynamic, that, that those would be much more challenging to to keep, um, you know, the children in a good place if they had to be across two homes, managing those issues across two homes. And I don't think any relationship is hopeless. So Mm -hmm. I would always encourage couples to, if I'm working with an individual who's contemplating divorce, to at least try couples therapy and see if there's a benefit to it. But Mm -hmm. the, the part that Um, where I might start to kind of move in a different direction in terms of the focus of therapy is I have seen both men and women become symptomatic with depression and anxiety seemingly as a result of staying in a, in a relationship that doesn't meet their needs for others, for the benefit of their children, for the benefit of their families of origin, um, or even for the benefit of their partner, you know, feeling like their partner isn't going to be okay on his or her own. Right, and and I always tell people, your children are a good reason to get you into my office. They're not they're not going to keep you there, and right. <laughs> you know, uh, because well, one because that's way too much pressure on on children, and Absolutely. and the children actually feel it. I mean, whether or not they mm-hmm. understand it or not, they actually feel. I mean, I you know that, that they have to you know that they're what's keeping their parents together, and that has mm-hmm. all kinds of 
notifications. <laughs> but, but yes, I've, when I worked with kids and teens, which I don't really anymore, but when I did, um, I had, I can't tell you how many times I heard, and I don't know if you work with kids or teens, but how many times I heard, oh, my parents should have gotten divorced a long time ago, because they right. are very acutely aware, whether there's open conflict or not, they're, they're in tune with the fact that things are not okay. <laughs> right. And, you know, and again, I think that's, I think that's one of the things because I was just talking with, with um, a client the other day and his parents got divorced when he turned 18 and went to college. And so what he felt like was that everything he grew up with was a lie. And he wasn't, he's not the first client I've had. Right. I had a client who she was in her 30s when her parents got divorced and she felt exactly the same way. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. I mean, cause there, you know, cause a lot of people will say, well, we'll just, we'll just hold out until the kids are teenagers or until they go away. But, but like you said, they are aware, they know something's going on, but I want to talk about this um, having an emotional affair, because of course that's always a challenging subject to approach because, you know, people go, well, I'm not having a fear. I didn't sleep with this person. I didn't have sex with this person. I'm going, okay, mm-hmm. yes, that may be true. But, you know, my, my rule of thumb is if you wouldn't do it with your partner standing right next to you, it's probably not a good idea. So mm-hmm. talk more about, uh, about what is an emotional affair and why do they happen? It goes back to not having needs met, and obviously we all have to identify what's a want and what's a need, right? Sometimes our wants can feel like needs, but yes. and there are some needs that you can kind of farm out, like uh, uh, just a quick personal example. When I was in my clinical training to do this work, I was fascinated by it and also overwhelmed by it. So I wanted to talk about it all the time, obviously without revealing anybody's personal information. But sure. And my, my partner at the end of a long day had absolutely no interest in, <laughs> you know, in hearing yes. about some of this. So I learned that having steady supervision more often than I had been was important because I needed a space to talk about what, you know, what I was experiencing and, and, you know, mm-hmm. if I was helping a folks or not. And um, so that was a need that was safe to farm out, right? It was, it was completely appropriate. But when you start to, when you start to look to other people for, to meet your emotional and of course, physical needs, and it becomes more of a priority than, the way that you are holding your marriage sacred, that that Uh to me is when it it crosses the line, meaning are, you know, are you, are you of course being dishonest about your communication with this person? Are you having Mm -hmm. to make, you know, carve time out of your day to, to have conversations with this person, whether it be over text or over the phone or seeing them. Um, Uh And, and again, just how, how much, time and and emotional energy they take up in your life if it's more than your marriage I think you have to take a look at that absolutely and and, um I talk to my clients about you know Maslow calls them needs of deprivation meaning you don't necessarily know you have them until somebody's meeting them it's like you don't know you're hungry until you start smelling something really good it's like oh my gosh (laughs) sure sure and, you know, and, and this can happen in terms of, of the emotion is that, oh, suddenly somebody's interested in me and they're talking with me and it's, and you don't even realize that there's anything harmful about it, you know. And so I just want people mm-hmm. to understand that this, 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 these are things that happen and they aren't, you know, I try to get my clients away from judging good, bad, right, wrong. It's just like, okay, is this situation supporting us or is it harming us and if it's harming us let's take a look at it and so that takes me into you you, as part of this article you talked about that you know that you that that just because these signs are present it doesn't mean the marriage is going to end and so what can somebody do if they know that one or more of these things are happening in their marriage right so and I didn't get to choose the uh <laughs> to choose the um the way that the article was framed i i i don't personally love saying signs of a bad marriage because i feel like that out of the gate sets it up 
to sound hopeless. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's, you know, these, these are signs that can show up in any marriage to varying degrees, especially long-term marriages where you go through, you know, quite a bit together and also external stressors. I mean, the last 14 months have certainly shown us that, but therapy isn't for everyone. Of course, because this is the work I do, I believe in it very strongly. I would always Mm -hmm. encourage couples to at least give it a try if they are part of a faith community and they trust, you know, a leader in their faith community, is that a resource that they could speak to about what they're experiencing? If they have family members or friends that have marriages that that feel solid to them or look like the type of marriage that they aspire to, you know, talking to trusted folks in their life, just because mm-hmm. when with any with any issue, right? Even when we work with individuals, if you just let it rattle around in your head. It, it's a completely yeah. different experience than, <laughs> you know, than saying it out loud and also getting the feedback from, you know, somebody who's a little bit removed from, from the situation or in the, in the case of, you know, trusted people in your life, they know you, they know your spouse. And, and um, of course you have to be careful about who you turn to right. because sometimes, uh, you know, the person may fuel the fire <laughs> rather than be, you know, be in that kind of removed position. But I, I, I think it's always important for anyone who is considering such a significant decision to, to consult the people that they trust and, and access out, outside resources, bef- you know, before determining that, um, you know, that, that divorce is the right path. And it may be, it, it may be, right. but. But there, but but as you and I both know, because this is what we do, there are there are many more marriages that could be saved if your know, people have the right kinds of support. And I always liken it. I mean, I remember, I you know, um, when I was a fir- first a mother, and there was lots of stuff I didn't know, and it was just like you know, I remember having conversations that you know, and I never could have gotten my son potty trained without the help of his preschool teacher. <laughs> So uh, never would have happened. And, you know, so we don't have any qualms about going to our friends or, or, or family members about, you know, I mean, I actually remember asking my mother because there were my, my two sisters and I are three years apart. And I said to her, I said, how did you deal with two of us in diapers at the same time? She goes, I never did. And I went, oh, my God, you know, but it's like, you know, I was asking because I didn't know. But we don't do that with our marriages. You know, we think – you know, we think everybody else's, you know, it's like, you know, social media, everybody else's highlight reels and our blooper reels, you know. It's like mm-hmm. everybody goes through this. Every single relationship has challenges and strengths and, you know, and, and I love you talking about, you know, rattling around in our own heads because we only know what we know. We only know what we do. And so, but there's so much else out there. And that's where you know, people like, like you come in to, I mean, and you sound like me where, you know, you're always very optimistic that things can be better. Um, I, I don't know if you know who Bill O'Hanlon is, but he talked about being psychotically optimistic. I said, I'm stealing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, because even, like I said before, even people, you know, even marriages who you think are going to just never make it, that people can surprise you. But, it is getting that perspective, I think. Absolutely. And, and both people being willing to do the work, and I'm sure this happens for you as well. It, when couples do come in, they may be at different levels of motivation. So some of yes. our job is, you know, kind of getting them to a more similar place so that one person isn't feeling frustrated all the time that they're kind of putting in more effort um, mm-hmm. But as, as long as both people are willing and, and I mean, the fact that they show up in your office means that there's at least a little bit of motivation. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> you know, as long yeah, as both people are willing, it's, it's pretty amazing. It, I mean, it's lovely to see when couples can, you know, really come back together in these tender ways uh-huh. and, and clear up sometimes I have a couple that I actually just saw today that I've been working with on and off for a very long time. And they have had a, they have grown children, 
beautiful mm-hmm. children um, that are adults now, and to see how far they've come in really changing the dynamic of the way that they interact when either one of them is hurt is has been mm-hmm. it's 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 very rewarding to you know to see that happen. But they 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 work at it. I mean, they put in they put in the uh, <laughs> blood, sweat, and yeah. tears, so to so to speak. Well, and, and you know, and and I hear that frequently. It's like you know they you know they they'll say, well, I don't know if my partner really cares. I said they keep showing up <laughs> because I tell people I said I'm not anybody's preferred destination. <laughs> so, of course, yeah, better things you know, to do. <laughs> So, so if they're here, you know, it's like you've got, I mean, I realize it may not be going as quickly as you want, or they may not be, you know, they may not be getting it as fast as you would like, but, but they're still here. They're still, you know, they're still showing up. And, yeah, I mean, and it can be frustrating work because most people, as I tell people, most people don't know what they don't know about relationships. And I still think everybody should have to take a relationship one-on-one class before they graduate from high school. Um, <laughs> but, but you, you know, and, and we're all doing what we know. And so can we be open and curious and supportive and all those things that we were when we first met? <laughs> um, you know, right. and to stop and to stop looking at going to see somebody like you or me as punishment. You know? <laughs> um, my, I, look at, my, I look at my clients as being the most courageous people I've ever met because they've picked up the phone. They've walked through the door. It takes a lot. It takes a lot to show that level of vulnerability, whether it's individual or as a couple. I think it, I would venture to say it's, it's harder as a couple because you, you know, we all have our not so great moments and we're kind of right. letting them bear if we're being honest. And my right. former business partner and I, we had for a, a period of time really had hoped to bring more attention to premarital counseling just for these mm-hmm. reasons, you know, that not, not to view it as, Oh gosh, if we're not even married and we already need to see a counselor, it must mean that we're doomed and this is terrible. Right. But as, as a way to talk through, I mean, it, it always amazes me how much, people don't really talk about before they get married that's important to them. Right. And then they're in it and they feel like, well, this isn't what I signed up for. It, it, it's, I mean, I think we're getting better. I think as, as we go on, the generations are, are much more embracing of therapy. Thank goodness. But yeah, there are so many conversations that couples don't have before they enter into marriage with each other. Oh, I believe me. I'm right there with you. So, Virginia, can you share with people where they can learn more about you and, and uh, maybe how to get in touch with you? Yes. Yeah, so the website is www.collaborativect, as in Connecticut, dot com. And okay. you can read more about me there, about our group. Uh, there's a way to email me. Obviously, our phone is listed, so... Um, lots of good resources there if, if anybody is looking for more information or now that we have the telehealth option, at least for now, we can, mm-hmm. uh, we can be more accessible. <laughs> yes, yes. So as the great baseball player Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. And there are many steps you can take to make sure your marriage can not just survive but actually thrive. It doesn't have to end if you're willing to take action to make it better. Unfortunately, many couples wait a long time and allow a lot of damage to occur before addressing their challenges, and I really do not want that to be you. So is your marriage all you want it to be? If not, then I ask, what do you need to do to take action? And hopefully one of the things you'll continue to do is listen to this show. So until next week... They love it.